Hi class, it's Mrs. Grinzel. Tonight we're going to learn about the spinal cord and here's your learning targets. The spinal cord is a reflex center and it's a conduction pathway between the brain and the peripheral nervous system. The ascending tracks carry sensory information up to the brain and the descending tracks, the ones that go down, carry motor impulses from the brain to muscles and glands or to the effectors. We learned in our previous unit that reflexes are automatic subconscious responses to stimuli. The brain doesn't have to be involved. So we know the spinal cord then is a major reflex center. Many reflexes run through the spinal cord. And here we have an example of a withdrawal reflex running from the skin going to the spinal cord. There's an interneuron in the spinal cord and that converges on a motor neuron going out to our muscle. Three neurons is all that's involved in this simple spinal reflex. So we learned in our previous unit that reflexes are automatic subconscious responses to stimuli. The brain is not involved in the response. In this example, we see a withdrawal reflex. We see the receptor located in the skin. The impulse travels to the spinal cord. The information from the first neuron is conveyed to a second neuron that's embedded in the spinal cord, and then that converges onto a motor neuron leaving the spinal cord and going directly to that muscle to tell it what to do. So this reflex involves three neurons only. This is an example of another withdrawal reflex. They're designed to protect us from tissue damage. So we see a sensory receptor located in the skin, the person stepping on a tack, which triggers that sensory receptor to send an impulse to the spinal cord. The spinal cord again has one interneuron present and then uh, we quickly send the impulse on a motor neuron out to those leg muscles to pull that leg out of the way. The spinal cord extends from the foramen magnum, which is the hole at the base of the skull where the cord can exit. Right below the medulla, the cord begins, and it travels to the second lumbar vertebrae, which is down here in the lumbar enlargement. This skinny little tail part down here, the phylum terminale, is not really part of the cord. It's an attachment to stabilize the cord. So it's attaching the cord to your tailbone or your coccyx. We saw previously that the brain is enclosed in protective meningi layers, and the same is true for the spinal cord. We have the same three layers, the pia mater attached right to the cord, then we have the cerebral spinal fluid surrounding that, the arachnoid mater holding that fluid in, and then we have the dura mater or that toughest layer on the outside. There are two types of tracks in the cord, the ascending tracks that are carrying sensory information to the brain, so the brain knows what's going on with the body and what's going on in the outside world and then the descending tracks, which are carrying information from the brain to tell the body what to do. So it's going out to our muscles and to our glands. As an example, we have the rubrospinal tract right here in this spot, and it is carrying information on descending tracks out to the muscles in our upper extremities to get those muscles to contract. So in this picture, we can see tracks at work running through the cord. So in our example, it looks like we have a withdrawal reflex again. So we're starting with our sensory receptor over here. It's picking up information that's traveling along the sensory neuron over to the cord. And then it has got an interneuron converging on a motor neuron, and that's part of a withdrawal reflex. But we also can have that sensory information heading up to the brain along this ascending tract here. So we want the brain to know what's happening with our body, so the reflex is happening at the same time we're sending information up to the brain so the brain understands why our muscles are moving. We also see that we have whoops, a descending tract over here where the brain is just directly telling this muscle 
since it's talking to it right here, what to do. So it wants that muscle to contract or this effector to contract. Tracks are made of axons. The axons cross over at various areas en route to the brain or coming from the brain. Some cross over in the brain stem, some cross over in the spinal cord. Most fibers cross over, most of our motor fibers, the ones that control our muscles, cross over in the medulla oblongata. So the left hemisphere controls muscles on the right side of the body, and vice versa. If we look up here in our picture, here's our motor cortex on the right side of our body, and the motor impulse is traveling down through the brain stem, through the midbrain, the pons, and then in the medulla, we see those tracks crossing over and moving to the left side of the cord. So they end up controlling muscles on the left side of the body. The corticospinal tract is the main motor tract from your motor cortex of your brain. It's the same picture I just showed you, showing that those motor impulses do cross over as they make their way from the medulla. There is a tutorial if you'd like some more information on the tracks um, at this WISC online website. So you can go there if you need some more information. Spinal cord injuries, as we know, can be terribly dangerous and can lead to paralysis. So when we snap that cord, we sever it, it's been torn, the tracks are torn, we know it's a permanent injury and there's permanent damage to the sensory and motor tracks. But sometimes we don't actually tear right through those tracks, but the damage can still be fairly severe and still cause, cause paralysis. So when we do maybe get in a car accident and we haven't snapped our cord, but those vertebrae have been contorted and they're applying a lot of pressure onto our cord, physical trauma to the cord, the cord is mechanically stimulated and it'll start firing constant action potentials. And that constant work of those impulses running down the cord eventually can kill neurons. So ones that weren't actually torn and damaged, can die anyway. And then those dying neurons release calcium ions, which activate enzymes that are there to break down that dead dying tissue, which, you know, enzymes spill on good neurons also and can cause further damage. And then we also have white blood cells arriving to the area because they are supposed to be cleaning up the debris, getting rid of old dead dying cells. And they cause inflammation, which can cause further mechanical stimulation on healthy neurons. And then that leads to the constant action potentials being fired again. And more neurons are destroyed. So... When an injury happens, we really do have to wait, you know, an extended period of time to really figure out what the extent of the damage is going to be. Um, while that swelling is in there and that inflammation is going on and the white blood cells are running around, more and more neurons or tracts can be damaged and die. So let's look at a car accident scenario again because in those situations where your body is thrown bing bang around inside the car or outside the car, we might not sever our cord all the way through. But again, we can damage parts of our cord just through that physical trauma, those vertebrae pushing on those tracks. And when that happens, maybe one or two tracks die and the rest of the cord remains healthy. And that can cause what's called a hemi lesion. And those hemi lesions leave you with some functions while you lose other functions. For example, you might lose the ability to feel pain in your arm, but in the same place in your arm you could still feel touch because the pain and the touch are running on different tracks and we only damage the pain tract. So we're going to look at an example of a hemi lesion or looking at how we can lose functionality based on what information is on the tracks. So in our picture here, we have two different sensory receptors located in the skin. We're going to say that this one is our pain receptor, and this one is our temperature receptor. So they're both starting on the left side of the body, but our temperature receptor crosses over 
right here in the spinal cord. And now it's running on a different tract going up the right side of the body while our pain receptor is still on the left side of the body. So if I had an injury to my spinal cord at this right side area, I would damage um, just part of my spinal cord, not all of it, and I would lose temperature sensation in that part of my skin. But I wouldn't lose pain sensation because that tract over on the left side is still unharmed. In a different scenario, if I have an injury farther up on the cord, maybe in my brain stem up here, and I'm just damaging the left side, then, or excuse me, I'm damaging the right side of the cord here, both the pain and temperature are very close to each other on tracks, and there's a good chance I'm losing both of those sensory functions in my skin.